Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. It was hailed as an oasis of political stability and a model of growth in Africa. But for the past year, Ethiopia has been in the news, not because of its economic success, but insecurity on its streets. Ethiopians, mostly from the Oromo and Amhara ethnic groups, are angry about what they say is decades of marginalization. They're also upset about government plans to build factories on land they consider their own. The protests have frequently grown violent and police are accused of responding with unnecessary force. Activists say at least 450 people have been killed. For the first time in 25 years, ruling party leaders have declared a six-month state of emergency. It gives the government power to ban protests and troops can be deployed to maintain calm. The kind of uh, threats that we are facing, the kinds of attacks that are now targeting civilians, targeting critical infrastructures, targeting investments, uh, are not such that they could be effectively handled through ordinary law enforcement uh, procedures. We are not here trying to control protests through the state of emergency. We are trying to address a coordinated and concerted orchestrated attack against the Ethiopian state itself. That needs to be clear. Our protesters say this conflict is the result of decades of ethnic tension. The Tigray ethnic group has dominated Ethiopian politics for years, but it represents only about 6% of the country's 96 million people. More than one third of the population are Oromos. They are the largest ethnic group. The second largest is the Amharas, around 25 million or a quarter of the population. Both the Oromos and Amharas complain of political and economic marginalization. They also accuse the police of harassment, wrongful arrests, and unfair sentences. The Ethiopian government says those accusations are unfound. Well, as you heard earlier, the Ethiopian government says the recent unrest is an attack on the state. That the protesters have been armed and trained by so-called foreign enemies. Eritrea is named as one of them. Ethiopia has a long-standing border dispute and went to war with the Eritrean army in the late 1990s. Egypt is also accused of stoking unrest. They are at odds over Ethiopia's decision to build a dam on the Nile River, which could lead to water shortages in Egypt. Well, let's uh, now get to the thoughts of our guest. Joining us from London, we have Awol Allo, uh, lecturer at Kiel University and in Minneapolis, Nagesa Odo, chairman of Oromo, the Oromo Federalist Congress International uh, Support Group. Good to have you both with us, gentlemen. I want to let you know as well that we did try uh, to reach out to the government side uh, to get somebody from there, and we were initially assured that we would get someone, but uh, so far uh, we, they have not been returning our calls uh, as of this time. So we will uh, plow on. I, I want to start with, uh, uh, with you, Nagesa Odo. What, what, are you, what, what are the root causes of these protests? These, these have been going on for some months now, but it is part of tensions that have been building up for a long time, isn't it? Actually, the immediate cause for this protest was the Addis Ababa master plan, which uh, takes some land from Oromia Regional State and uh, put it under Addis Ababa municipality. And uh, the displacement of farmers and the land grab was the immediate cause. However, the cause for this protest is uh, marginalization, uh, economic, political, and social ma marginalization that has been taking place uh, the last 25 years on Oromo people, basically. And there is no freedom, there is no democracy, there is no rule of law, and the Oromo ethnic group has been right, marginalized and has been excluded from economic, political, and social uh, uh, sphere in Ethiopian or TPLF regime. Awol Allo, what do you believe is behind this wave of protests? No, I fully agree with uh, what uh, uh, Nagasa said. Uh, this is basically a culmination of uh, decades of marginalization, exclusion, and oppression of the Oromo people who actually constitute the majority in that country. Uh, what actually makes the current situation worse uh, compared to previous uh, systems is that you have a very tiny minority uh, uh, from northern part of Ethiopia, as you say, the Tigray uh, um, uh, elites, who 
completely uh, uh, marginalized and oppressed uh, the Oromos and other groups. So the idea that you have a minority group that is supported by the West uh, uses various tools and mechanisms to perpetuate this oppressive relationship, relationship of inequality, uh, was a very unsustainable situation from the start. This has been simmering underground for the last 25 years, and now it boiled over. And what do you think is, is, uh, is I mean, wh wh why now? This is, this, you're saying that it's boiling over now. This is the result of years of, of pent-up frustration. I think there are, there are several reasons. Uh, one is, of course, uh, the fact that the government continued to uh, sort of deepen and intensify uh, the repression after uh, the days of the former uh, Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, Mbele Zenawi. Uh, the uh, um, uh, dispossession of farmers from their land has intensified. Uh, of course, on the other side, apart from the intensification of repression, on the other side, uh, you have social media providing uh, a very useful platform for young people, activists, to sort of share information, mobilize and organize uh, against the government. In the past, you have a situation in which the government completely controls all sorts of information. Uh, there is no freedom of the press in Ethiopia. Uh, there are a uh, couple of uh, TV stations, uh, both are owned by the Ethiopian government, internet is owned by the, by the government, uh, even radio stations are owned by the government in Ethiopia. So it's a complete darkness. What social media did is basically open up the system against the will of the government. It offered uh, young uh, uh, people uh, with the platform to sort of share information from local areas, uh, uh, send that information across to uh, uh, people uh, outside the country who could uh, feed in that information to media. So that has actually played a very significant role in terms of uh, reordering the balance of forces. So by balance of forces, I just mean that I don't mean the equality between government and, 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 and young people, but people began to have some voice on this platform. Well, let's put that then to uh, Nagesa Odo. Um, how much of a difference do you think social media has played uh, in all of these uh, protests, particularly in, in this digital age we live in where it is increasingly difficult for governments to suppress dissent and to hide information. Social media has played a tremendous role because uh, previously the government was successful in uh, uh, controlling the information by uh, arresting, detaining all journalists in that country. It can easily uh, arrest uh, newspaper editors it can easily arrest uh, any media any journalist in that country and that way it could it could control the information however this time every individual anybody who has a mobile phone and who can who can who can use uh, a computer uh, or who can have a laptop or whatever can use a social media and can send information to to people abroad and uh, th that way information can easily circulate and can be uh, broadcasted so the government could not control anything it it used to it, the ethiopian government has been killing its own citizens for the last 25 years but it is only this the last two years that information uh, came out videos came out pictures came out it has been killing i i have been in that country i myself was a victim of uh, incarceration i have been in prison for three years i have been in in a makalawi uh, the, 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 the 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 torture center i have been to kaliti i have been to karchelle so all those days all those years when we were in university when we have experienced it, like all those killings in the prison there was a massacre in which in, uh, in, in October 2005 in which 100 people 109 people have been killed and that information has not been imparted that information has not uh, has not uh, get out to the world however this time people can easily uh, get uh, pictures and videos of all those killings had it been 10 years ago, the Irecha massacre in which 678 people have been killed and which we can see live videos would not have been there. But this time, uh, people can easily take pictures from their mo mobile phone. They can just record a video. So the Ethiopian government cannot hide the massacre and the genocide it is committing against its own citizen. And that has played a tremendous role. 
Awol Alo, um, as you know, the Ethiopian government has declared a state of emergency as a result of, uh, of all of these protests and, and the violence that has accompanied it. What effect do you think it will have on the country? Because the government says they need this to restore security, and they talk about several groups that are inciting violence. Uh, first of all, uh, governments declare emergency or state of emergency when uh, they are confronted with uh, a threats uh, that have the potential uh, to call into question the very life of a nation. So that is usually uh, the standard for declaring a state of emergency. So what the Ethiopian government is confirming to all that are interested in Ethiopia, whether it is Ethiopian citizens, uh, uh, investors, uh, regional actors of the international community, is that it is actually... Uh, uh, losing control and trying to reassert authority. And I think that is one of the messages that is sending because you cannot declare a state of emergency unless the nation has uh, faced a threat uh, that calls into question the very continuity of, uh, of the nation. That is one message uh, that it is sending. The other important dimension of the state of emergency is the suspension of uh, rights and freedoms that uh, individuals enjoy under normal circumstances. Uh, whether these are rights that are provided under the Constitution or other international human rights instruments, uh, those rights would be suspended, except those uh, that are uh, non-suspendable. Um, in the particular context of Ethiopia, uh, the country has been under de facto emergency for the last 25 years. Uh, the constitution guarantees a range of progressive rights, very vibrant set of rights, uh, but these rights have never been implemented and citizens have never been able to enjoy them. And the country, uh, uh, I think, is reputable for being one of the most repressive uh, countries around the world. So insofar as the exercise of rights and freedoms are concerned, the declaration of emergency doesn't really make a material difference on the ground. What it would do, however, is that it would provide uh, a legal and constitutional framework, if you like, for this war that has already been declared on, uh, on the people uh, by the government. Uh, just before, by the way, uh, about a month ago, the Ethiopian Prime Minister authorized the military and, and, and security forces to use all means necessary in relation to the protests in the Amhara region. Oromia has been under martial law for the last uh, seven, eight months. So uh, uh, other than enabling the government to sort of provide this already uh, ongoing war with a legal constitutional framework, I don't think it would actually uh, make a significant uh, uh, difference. It would also, uh, I think, legitimize the government's uh, uh, practice of moving uh, heavy weapons and, and uh, equipment that usually belong to uh, uh, the war zone uh, into civilian areas, uh, into uh, cities, for example. Uh, the state of emergency might allow the government to do those things. Other than that, uh, I don't think it would have a considerable effect. Nagesa Odo, uh, do you fear that this state of emergency that's being imposed by the government will, will have the effect of uh, legitimizing its, its crackdown on dissent? Do you, do you fear that things will, will only get worse because of this? Yeah, I think so. Actually, the country has been under a state of a de facto state of emergency for the last 25 years because the government has never uh, obeyed or uh, have, have never been uh, acting as per the constitution or as per the laws. It has been detaining people without court warrant. It has been killing. Uh, Oromia uh, regional state has been under martial law without even declaring the state of emergency. So de facto it has been under a state of emergency. However, this now, this time it is authorizing that action, any arbitrary killing and every uh, arbitrary detention and uh, to do whatever it likes, it wants us to intensify all that. But there is, it, in, it is an indication for the regime that it is about to scramble. That is the one indication. However, the people has been waiting for change for this government. I mean, so that this government would change something for the last 25 years. Every five years, this government has been holding elections. Every five years, it holds election. People were expecting some change, some policy change, some whatever change, or it would democratize itself, or it would listen to the voice of the people. It has never done that, and the people now. Uh, knew that and despair and so people would not expect any change from this government and however this government is always admitting that it's a it's our problem and the people have a, a legitimate grievance it says that uh, uh, however it never implement and it never really take that serious therefore the people would not have any hope from this government
So while the people do not have any hope from this government, people will not go back. And this government, uh, uh, even though it accepts that it, there, there is a political problem, it, would, it is not going to political solution. This political problem has, needs political solution, and the government is not going that way. It seems that it decided to, to keep on the crackdown and to silence uh, uh, this by gunpoint. And I guess, Odo, I want to ask you as well, as somebody from the, the political opposition, the, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, Hail Mariam Desalenya, has said uh, this Tuesday that um, he recognizes that uh, the government is not, uh, does not fully represent uh, the Ethiopian people, and he wants to reform the country's electoral system, uh, which he recognizes has excluded um, oppos many opposition uh, groups, do you? What, what is your response to that? Is this just talk, or I mean, uh, will you wait and see to whether he follows through on that? I think this is too little, too late. Uh, uh, the reason why I say this is, even when they say they want to uh, discuss with opposition, they have their, op their own opposition. They have some opposition. They they uh, made themselves. I mean, they there are some opposition they fund. They, they don't really discuss with a genuine opposition. For example, there is uh, some council of uh, uh, political parties in Ethiopia. They excluded like real opposition such as Madrek, the largest, which, uh, uh, which has four parties within it, like Oromo Federalist Congress, Arena Tigray, and Southern uh, People's Nation and Nationality, uh, which is led by uh, Professor uh, um, uh, Bayene Petros. They just exclude these people and they just uh, uh, talk, discuss with the opposition they like. So I don't think they are ready uh, to discuss with the opposition. So uh, in this way, when they do not want to include all oppositions and all stakeholders, I don't think that will solve the problem. And the problem is from the root. The problem is from the system. The problem is from the way the system was established. So unless that problem has been solved from its root, unless like they go to a national inclusive dialogue and a kind of transitional government in which uh, people would have a say and all stakeholders would have a, a say, that, that would not solve any problem. Uh, Awol Alo, the, uh, uh, the government is, is saying, as, as I said, that they, that they want to, uh, that they recognize this need of, of further representation of, uh, uh, through the electoral system. And um, it's interesting that the Prime Minister made these comments at the same time that German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, was visiting the country. So I guess my question is, what, what sort of pressure uh, could the international community uh, apply here? Um, I think the, the reason the, the Prime Minister uh, came up with that explanation is because uh, they won uh, or they declared uh, to have 100 percent of seats in Parliament. Uh, that, of course, is unjustifiable by any standard. And I cannot think of any democracy on the world or on earth uh, in which uh, a party that has stayed on power the previous 25 years uh, could win 100% of seats in parliament, not just at the federal level, but also at the regional level. So the, the, the explanation that they came up with uh, uh, recently is that the problem is not really with the absence of uh, a commitment to democracy or with the lack of political will, it's rather the, the electoral system. So we have the first past the post system. What he's now saying is that we will consider uh, the possibility of introducing a proportional representation which would probably uh, allow opposition parties to enter parliament. But the reality is that it's not the electoral system that is a problem. It's not the electoral system that gave rise to 100% seats uh, or win to, to the government. Uh, as Negasa said, it is the complete absence of a political will uh, on the part of the key players in Ethiopia, particularly the Tigray People Liberation Front, to open up the system. Uh, um, the Oromo people, theoretically speaking, have a representation in parliament, but the people that represent the Oromo people are uh, former war captives that were created 
into a political party uh, by, uh, by TPLF itself. Just imagine the possibility of uh, former war captors that were created by another party to have the autonomy and dependence that it requires to defend the interests of their people. And the same is true for all the other coalitions that make up the EPRD for the Ethiopian People Revolutionary Democratic Front. So, uh, you know, the idea that by reforming the electoral system somewhat they could increase the representation of the opposition uh, they could they could do that. They could they could increase the uh, uh, representation of the opposition without uh, having to introduce a proportional representation system. But the problem is the uh, absence of a political will uh, on the part of the TPLF to open up the system, uh, uh, and that is where the problem lies. And I don't think any cosmetic change uh, in the system would really uh, address the key uh, central issues. Nagesa Odo, the government is also saying that uh, these protests are being fueled by uh, outside forces. Uh, and they point, uh, as, as we mentioned at the top there, they point to Egypt and Eritrea, two countries that have ongoing disputes uh, with Ethiopia over different issues. Uh, and that the, the, the motive to kind of stir our trouble in their minds is, is certainly there. What, what do you say to that? Uh, this is a complete lie. It is a lie. Uh, outside forces may have interest uh, to destabilize Ethiopia, as they said. However, people, as they have also admitted, people have a legitimate grievance, and uh, people have been trying uh, to change that system. People have been voicing so that their voice would be heard by this regime and so that the regime would uh, make some improvement. It's not only this time that people have uh, uh, protested. It's, it have been protesting uh, long ago, like in 2005, when uh, election was made and when uh, uh, CUD and uh, uh, another opposition uh, uh, made uh, a large, uh, uh, when they got a lot of chairs in the parliament. Uh, in 2005, for example, there was much protest going on uh, against the government because the government, the government wrecked the election. I mean, people want free and fair election. And the electoral board itself was made by the regime, and uh, it's it only there to protect the interest of the regime. The election is fake. People want change. People, uh, however, the, 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 the government have been telling the people that if we, uh, we are bringing economic development, if we uh, bring economic development, it's okay. This is a developmental state so that democracy would come later. Our democracy is always young. Even the, the last 10 years, 20 years, it has been saying that our democracy is young. We will change things after uh, it takes time. However, people want change, and we are witnessing that a regime without democracy, authority, authoritarian development, is not sustainable. Uh, development uh, without democracy, development with, re without respect of human rights is not sustainable. I mean, even though that government follows that a developmental state policy which says if we, we are bringing development, which is a lie, because which does not represent, maybe few have been developed or few have become millionaires, however, it's not, it's not across the board. So people are getting impoverished, people are getting poorer and poorer, therefore, People want change in that country, and it's not. This is not the first time people wanted. Uh, people protested in that country. People have been protesting, but it, the, it right. is not unified like this time. People were. I will, I will, I will I'll give the last word to you in the minute that we've got left. How do you see this playing out? Do you think? That, do you fear that things may get worse before they get better, unless these underlying sources of friction and frustration that you talked about are addressed? Yeah, can I just, uh, I just want to make a point in terms of uh, the government's uh, recent line about uh, Egyptian and, and Eritrean meddling. And I think this is one of the sort of uh, latest in a series of uh, blame games by the Ethiopian government uh, to sort of uh, uh, deflect the attention from uh, the, internal, the internal crisis. Uh, this is also a way of actually uh, besmirching and, and delegitimizing this legitimate grievance of the Oromos and other, other, other people. Uh, the, the, the real hardship, the marginalization, this painful suffering and anguish that the Oromos and other people go through is a very real fact. And I don't think Oromos and, and the rest of uh, the Ethiopian people need Egyptians or uh, Eritreans to tell them why it is important or to remind them that it is time to uh, fight for uh, equality and justice. That is going to have to be the last word. Thank you to both of you, Awol Alo and Nagesa Odo. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story.
And thank you for watching. As always, you can see the program again anytime. Just visit our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Seeker and the whole team here. Bye for now.